Before we get into the message today, we wanted to say a special hello to our extended family around the world. And we wanted to thank you for joining us. Whether you are watching from our River of Life Church app, Facebook, or YouTube channels, we're so thankful to be connected with you. Now we're gonna talk about good works today. So in one sense, uh, works are, are of uh, no value whatsoever when it comes to salvation. And then in another sense, works are of supreme value. So they're, they're worthless over here, and they have incredible value over here. So on this side, they don't do you any good. But on this side, they're absolutely essential. As a matter of fact, they are part of the destiny of every person. But if you go over here, they don't do you any good at all. So oftentimes we get confused. We don't know which side are we on here. What do, what do we do? Do we do nothing or do we have to do something? Or what is it that we do? Will anything do as far as works are concerned? Can we just do whatever we want? Or, or do we not need to worry about it at all? Jesus did all the work on the cross for us. And so we just sit back and relax and wait for our time to come to punch the ticket to heaven. So we're going to talk about that quickly this morning. Good works. Good works. Before we do, let's just get this into our head so that we'll be repeating it as we go along. I want you to say this with me. Do the good works. Yeah. Do the good works. Yes. So we'll just kind of get that into our head. It helps to hear it and then say it and see it in our minds. The Bible says, for it is by grace... God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of ourselves, not through your own effort, but it is the undeserved, gracious gift of God, not as a, not as a result of your works, nor your attempts to keep the law, so that no one will be able to boast or take credit in any way for his salvation. So we're saved because we are drawn to Christ by the Holy Spirit, and we are saved through no effort of our own. No works will accomplish it. There's nothing we can do to earn God's love. There's nothing that we can do to earn forgiveness. All of the judgment, all of the fury of the devil fell on Jesus on the cross so that you and I could experience the, the grace of God and have the free gift of salvation given to us by faith. All I, all I do is just simply ask for it. I just simply recognize what Christ has done and I receive that gift by faith. So we need to understand that good works cannot save anyone. So you can be the best do-gooder that there ever was. Uh, and, and it won't do you any good as far as dealing with your sins. You can give away all your money. You can volunteer all of your time. You can deny yourself all kinds of things. And none of that, which amounts to works that we're trying to do to be able to sort of earn God's favor or God's, God's blessing, God's forgiveness, none of that will work. None of it will work. So when we hear that, we, we sometimes feel a little bit frightened, like, well, what do, you, what do you mean? You mean that there's nothing I can do? I'm doomed. No, you're not doomed. You're not doomed because Christ paid the price for all of your sins. Christ did all of the work on the cross that was required by God for righteousness to be conferred on you as a gift. It's not your righteousness, it's his righteousness. And so we, we rejoice in that, and we praise God for that. But just understand that as we go along talking about this for the next few minutes, understand the context that we're talking about this in. And I'm putting it in context by just simply telling you that, so I don't want you to get confused, that you're not saved by works. You're not saved by being a do-gooder. If you put money in the offering plate today, you're not going to get saved because you made a contribution or you made a donation. That's not going to work. You can't buy your way out of your sins. You can't work your way out of your sins. You've got to trust Christ and God's plan of salvation for fallen man, and you've got to receive the gift of salvation freely by faith. 
Number two, no one can work for God before they're born again. No one can work for God before they're born again, but everyone must work for God after they are born again. Remember I said that on this side of being born again, works will not do any good whatsoever. It will not win you any points. It will not wipe away one of your sins. It will not earn you salvation even a little bit. But after you're born again and become a new creation in Christ, and the Bible calls this regeneration, using the word Genesis in the middle, Genesis was the beginning when God created them male and female. Regeneration is when we are recreated in Christ Jesus, and the Bible says that we're recreated in Christ for something very, very special that God has planned for us. The Bible says, for we are His workmanship or masterpiece, his own masterwork, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for what? Good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. So the new creation, this regenerated person, this new creature in Christ, as a result of being born again by the Spirit of God, is now synonymous with good works. Without Christ, good works are impossible. We can't even do them. Even if we knew what they were, we couldn't do them because we're, they can only be revealed and they can only be expressed and they can only be accomplished in Christ. But once we come to Christ, then the Bible says that good works are something that will be the hallmark of every single born-again believer. It becomes synonymous with who we are. And uh, you just simply cannot have one without the other. You cannot say that you're born again and not have good works. You cannot have good works without being born again. They go together. Are we tracking on this now? So good works and being born again are, are intertwined. They, they go together with one another. And it's impossible to have one without the other. I can't do good works and please God without faith. And I put my faith in Christ, and then all of a sudden, the revelation of these good works that God has prepared for me come to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to walk with the Lord and take the steps that He's prepared beforehand that I should take. So when we talk about good works, you're, you're thinking, and maybe I would be thinking about all of the good things that we've done for God since we got saved. You know, I, I, I've started tithing. I, I go to church. That's a good thing. I, I, I serve. Maybe you're serving on one of the ministry teams here. I, I've done this. I've done that. I've shared my faith with different people. I read my Bible. I pray some. All of these things I, I do. And so these are all good works, right? And so I'm doing the good works. So let us define good works, shall we? Let's, let's look at this from the context of the scripture that we just read, and let's break this down a little bit. What is the meaning of good works? The meaning of good works will, will vary or differ if we were to ask for definitions right now from each person in the room, and you felt free to express yourself, you would say, well, I think it's this, and I think good works are that. And you'd be thinking of good from your perspective and good as you define it, because we all think that we know what good is, don't we? And you all recommend restaurants to people say the food there was very good. Get this. And the person says that wasn't good. It was good to you, but it wasn't good to them. So it varies. So sometimes good depends on our judgments based on our taste. We have a taste for this, a taste for that. And we think that that's good because that's the only thing that we can, that we can conclude. And we're limiting the definition to our, ourselves. But the Bible tells us exactly here in these, in these passages uh, what it is. W good works are works that originated with God. Not with you. Amen. Not with me. Not with the Salvation Army. Not with the Red Cross. Amen. Not with Samaritan's Purse. They originated with God. In the mind of God. In the heart of God. They are works that are decided before you're born before you went to school, before you developed a desire for certain things or an attraction for certain things, before you thought anything, dreamed anything, or were even saved. In the mind and heart of God, these works had their origin. 
it's the source, it's the fountain of all of these good works, comes out of the mind of God, comes out of the heart of God. God looked at you, knew you before you were ever born, and God decided the good work that he would have you do. Before you went to school and learned a trade or d decided that you liked history or you liked math or before you had any ideas or dreams or vision about your life, God already knew. He had already decided. You're trying to make up your mind, aren't you? I'm trying to make up my mind. What do I do? How do I serve God? What does God want me to do? Well, God says, I've already decided that. Well, when did you decide that? Before you were ever born. Well, when did you know what I was going to do? Before you got saved. Well, how did you know that? Because I'm God and I knew. I knew. I knew you. When you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. There are works that have been prepared for and provided for by God. What God plans and decides for you and me, he makes preparation for. So that means everything is stockpiled already for whatever it is that you're supposed to be working on. Whatever good work you're supposed to do, God's made preparation for that. God is not scrambling around right now trying to pull together. There are no supply chain issues with God. He's not saying, well, I can't, I don't know if we can get it together. I don't know if we can get all the stuff together for, you know, these guys to do what I plan for them to do. No, the works that God decided and prepared and planned for and determined before you were ever born and ever got saved, he's also made provision for it. God's not going to have you work and not give you the tools to do the work that he planned for you to do. So if that involves money, it's there. If it involves people, they're there. If it involves a certain place, it's, it's prepared for you. It's ready for you to get there. It's not going to get ready. It is ready. God made it ready. He prepared beforehand. And these are works that not only originate in the heart of God and are decided before you were ever born and prepared for so that there's nothing lacking, nothing missing, nothing broken, but these are works that, that actually get done. They actually get done. I've had some dealings over the years with architects, and they've told me about the, uh, the, the mountains of blueprints that are gathering dust all over the country where people made plans, but they never built that building. Some of you have been in churches where they had a building program like that. And you gave and gave and gave, and all you paid for was the blueprints. And they're gathering dust someplace, in a closet somewhere in some, in some building. So the good works are the good works that actually get done. They, they get accomplished. Not good intentions, not good ideas, not, a, not oh, I got a great plan. I got a great plan. Well, are, when are you going to do it? I don't know. I just, I got this great plan. I keep carrying this great plan around. I got this great dream. I got this great vision. I got this great prophetic word. It's stuff that actually happens. A good work gets done. If God planned for it and prepared for it and decided it, it's going to happen. The devil can't stop it. People can't stop it. Circumstances can't stop it. It's going to get done. The good works are the works that can only be done by faith. If you can do it by yourself, it's a work, but it isn't the good work that God planned. The good work that God planned is one that will probably scare the living daylights out of you. When God reveals it to you, you'll say, get behind me, Satan. You'll be absolutely terrified. You'll say, I don't have the qualifications for that. I don't have the experience for that. I don't, have the, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't even have a desire to do that. It's not even what I want to do. And, and, and it's a work that you'll have to do by faith. You'll have to just know, God, I know you're not confused. If you've decided that this is the work, then it's the work. And it may, not, it may not be the work that, that I planned for. It may not be the work that I prepared for, but you prepared for this work. You see, we get real stubborn about making God do the work that we prepared to do. Well, I went to school for this, so this is what I got to do. I got a big amount of student loan debt that I got to, and so I'm going to do this, you know, so help me, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do. And you're, God, you're going to have to bless it. You're just going to have to take it. You're going to have to accept it. This is the work that I want to do for you, and you're going to have to like it. And God doesn't like it. He doesn't have to like it. 
Doesn't have to take it. Doesn't have to do that. So let's go back and review this just real quickly. Good works are works that originate with God. They're decided before you were ever born. God prepares and provides for them. It's work that actually gets done, and it's work that requires faith. And my final point before Pastor Miriam comes is good works have the power to influence the attitude of everyone toward God. It influences the attitude of others toward God. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So our faith and obedience to do the good works that he prepared instead of some other kind of so-called good works will bring glory to God and not to us. When I do the good works that God has prepared for me beforehand, it's not about me anymore. It's not about what I do and what I don't do and how I look and how I feel and what other people think. The good works are the ones that have the power to cause people to stop and give glory and honor and praises to God. And some of those people will be Christian people, but, uh, but most of those people will be people who don't even know the Lord. But because you are being obedient to do by faith the work that is good that God prepared for you, people will stop and they will praise God because of it. Amen. Hallelujah. And who doesn't want to live for that? My point is, if we want to do the good works that God prepared for us, then we have to count the cost. Luke 14, 27 through 30, anyone who comes to me must be willing to share my cross and experience it as his own, or he cannot be considered to be my disciple. So don't follow me without considering what it will cost you, for who would construct a house before first sitting down to estimate the cost to complete it? Otherwise, he may lay the foundation and not be able to finish. The neighbors will ridicule him, saying, look at him. He started to build, but he couldn't complete it. And one of the things that we have noticed, all of us, is that we have a lot of good starters, but we have very few good finishers. You know, at this time of year, it's very common for us to think about starting something new, perhaps a new diet or a new exercise regime or a new Bible study. And many times we start with the best of intentions and we think, I'm going to do this. It's going to change my life. And then after a short period of time, we find ourselves fizzling out. Why? Because we looked at the benefits, but we failed to count the cost. And so the Lord tells us that if we are going to actually do the good works, that there's a cost to be paid and that we have to be willing to pay that. And you think, well, what is that? What do I have to pay? Doing the good works will cost our own will. It will cost our own will. Jesus himself prayed. He prayed, not my will, Lord, but yours be done. And if Jesus prayed that, how much more should we be praying? And you know, the sooner that we can learn, even as children, that the will of God is higher than ours, his ways are higher than ours, his thoughts are higher than ours, and even if it doesn't make sense to us in our finite mind, if we trust him, we will come to see that his way is better. I remember when I learned that as a child of 13, we were on the mission field. My father was a pastor, a missionary pastor, and I remember we had just settled in to our life in Brazil. I had finally mastered Portuguese as a child, I was involved in the youth group, and then all of a sudden, my parents told me, we're going to send you back to the United States to live with a family that we know to start high school. And I want to tell you that I struggled with that. I said, Lord, that doesn't even make sense. I have spent all this time. I have finally given my life to you. I've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're doing your work. It doesn't make sense for me to leave all this and go. And I struggled for a week, and I finally, I could not get any rest in my spirit, and I finally just said, Lord, I don't understand it. I don't see how this is going to help. I don't see how, and I was completely honest before him. I said, but I choose your will, not mine. 
And I will tell you that as a child of 13, the power of God hit me in my bedroom to such a degree when I prayed that prayer, I knew that whatever happened from then on out, that I was in his will and that he would take care of me. And even though I didn't understand every detail, that I would come to see that his plan was higher than ours. And so the sooner that we can learn that, even if we don't understand it, we can say, Lord, I want your will at all cost. Whatever cost it is to me, I want your will. The other thing that's going to cost us is our time. You know, we all think, I just wish I had more time. I just, I just don't even know where the days go, the hours go. And you know, we've all been given 24 hours a day. And if we can learn to give our time to God at the beginning of each day, we will be amazed to see at the end of the day that he helped us. We weren't just being out there, just being led around by our circumstances, but we were being led by the spirit of God. God took us and helped us. And I know many of you can probably echo this sentiment that when we give God our time, we get way more done than we do when we try to do it all our own. And what's more is he goes before us and he makes the way smooth and straight before us. I can remember learning that so much. So I don't even know why I would ever want to start a single day without first consecrating my time to the Lord. You know, there's many of us here, and I was thinking about this this morning. We look at our lives and we feel, a lot of times we feel shame and we feel just condemned because we feel like, I've wasted time, Lord. I've wasted my life. Let me encourage you with this scripture. It's one of my very favorite scriptures from the book of Joel. And the Lord says, I will redeem the time or the years that the canker worm destroyed. You see, the enemy comes to kill and destroy and to rob from us, but our God can take even that time and redeem it. I don't know how he does it. I don't know why he would do it, but he promised to do it. And if we come to him in faith and say, Lord, I've wasted time. I am so sorry. Would you now take control of my time and redeem it for your glory? In, in one of the translations that I read, it says, I will redeem the years that the crawling locust or the consuming locust consumed. And you know, many times we feel like the enemy has come just to consume and to, he knows our weaknesses. He gets in there. The Lord says, I will redeem those years. I will redeem it. He can do it. It will cost us total surrender, total surrender of our life. There was a generation that did not surrender to God in the Old Testament, and there was a generation that did. Do you remember when the Lord led Moses and the children of Israel out of Egypt? And you know, there was one problem with that. They came out of Egypt, but their mindset stayed in Egypt. They had gotten used to complaining, to murmuring, to living in unbelief, to living as though their God had abandoned them, and they continued on in that way. And the Lord was displeased, and he was saddened, and the result was that he said, you will not enter the promised land. And they spent 40 years wandering in the desert until they all died out. And then as the new generation was preparing to enter the promised land, everything changed. Everything changed. The Lord said to Joshua, take the men and circumcise them. You see, that was a sign of the covenant that marked them, that set them apart as being people of God. It identified them as God's own people. And God said, today I roll away all the reproach of Egypt off of you. Today I take away all that shame, all of that history, all of those years of complaining, of wandering in the desert, of living in unbelief, because you are my people. And the Lord said, celebrate the Passover. Once again, they entered into covenant. And so the result of this was, after they consecrated themselves to God, after they identified as God's own people, after they said, you know what? I don't want to be like my ancestors. I don't want to wander in the desert. I don't want to live in unbelief. I don't want to complain against God. I want to come near to God, drawing near to him, and he will draw near to me. I want to live as someone that is God's own child. And then immediately after this, when they were at Jericho, the very first city that they would conquer, 
the Lord revealed himself to them in a new way. He came to Joshua, and the Bible says in Joshua 5, 14, that the Lord says, I am coming to you as the commander of the army. He came and revealed himself to them as our warrior king, the captain of the host. They had never seen him or never been revealed that revelation of who he was. But it started with the consecration of their lives. It started with saying we want to fully embrace what you have done in us. And then he revealed himself. God revealed himself as the captain of the host. And I just want to say that God is getting re ready to reveal to us his character as our warrior king. I don't want to go into the battle without our warrior king in front of us, leading us through. And God is wanting to reveal himself. You see, you say that there's been many attacks in my life, and I would agree. This has been a time where we've seen a lot of things shaken, and the enemy has come at us in anger. But the captain of the host is stronger than any enemy that could come against you or that could come against me. And we are going to follow in his footsteps and we will see the victory. And this is my last one. It will cost us attacks from the enemy. 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. That was Paul. You see, when great and effective doors of ministry open to us, there are many adversaries. How many of you know the devil doesn't want to see the work of the kingdom go forth? I'm in no way comparing myself and my husband to the apostle Paul, but I will say this. I can echo that, that when we walk through the great and effective door to Jacksonville, North Carolina, there are many adversaries. And we have seen the devil rise up in all sorts of manners. And I know that you can probably agree and, and say the same thing. And you know, can I say that we never were tempted to quit? Absolutely, I cannot say that. If I were honest, there was one particular season where it just seemed like every single attack was so incredibly difficult that I wanted to quit every day. In fact, I can remember during that season going into my boss, right there, my boss's office, and say, I'm resigning, I'm done, I don't wanna work here anymore. And you know, thankfully, he never accepted my resignation. Thankfully, he never let me resign in weakness. He said, no, 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 he didn't even be, you know, it's like he didn't even listen to that. He's just like, yeah, go, go back to your office and continue on, carry on. But we need people that can discern what's really happening. We need people that will stand with us and say, no, 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 I'm not going to allow you to quit. No, you are not quitting because you are going to continue on and accomplish the good works that God has called you to that God prepared for you before the beginning of time. You will finish. You will not just start. Yesterday, I saw an incredible basketball game. It was my team, the University of Kentucky, and they had a fabulous first half, and I was cautiously optimistic. But I said to my husband, you know, it doesn't really matter what happens in the first half, because what happens in the second half is going to really determine the outcome. And my apologies to any Tennessee fans. Um, if you happen to be here today, but it is the second half that how you finish that is what is going to determine the outcome and I want to see all of us here at River of Life as we step into this year of 2022 Again, we may we say that we will consecrate our lives to him that we will give him our time our wills and we will not be stopped by any attack of the enemy. And if we see a brother or sister that's being tempted to quit, we will come alongside them and we'll say, I'm gonna walk with you and I'm gonna stomp on some devils with you. I'm gonna get down in the trenches and I'm gonna say that you are not going to stop short of the calling of God. We started well, but in Jesus' name, we will finish strong in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to finish up with, with one more thought. Here it is. If you try to serve God by being active and busy, doing things in church and the community, but you fail to perform the works God prepared for you to do, you will suffer great loss. You're a worker. You are busy. You have a reputation. 
You do this, you do that. You're known for what you do. So you're a doer. You know, you would, you'd say, I'm not, I don't just listen to the Word of God. I'm a doer of the Word of God. And that's wonderful. But we defined the difference between works and good works, didn't we? Works are just whatever. Good works are specific. Good works originate with God. Good works are planned for each individual before they're ever born. Good works are provided for by God. Good works require faith in order to be accomplished. So we will just recruit volunteers and we'll say, uh, you know, we want you to do this, we want you to do that, or people will come in and they'll want to know, what do you think you know, I should do with my life? Young people, uh, Ariana and Maurice are working with young people. They've got a Wednesday night class for the seniors and the seniors are wondering about their lives. What am I going to do? Am I going to go to college? Going to go in the military? Going to uh, go to some other kind of school, prepare for something? I need to do something. I can't just sit at home and play video games. I've got to prepare and I've got to do something. And it's difficult for us to really get a handle on that. We just say, well, I need to get a job, any job. I, I need to make money. I need to do something with my life. I've heard people say later on in life that they just did the best they could. You know, I just did the best I could. I, circumstances were such, and I, you know, I, I went this way when circumstances allowed me to, and when circumstances didn't, I didn't. And when a door opened up here, I, I kind of thought about it and took it and just things just kind of happened. I don't really know how they happened. They just kind of happened. I'm not really sure I know what I did with my life. I'm not really sure I know how I would answer that question. Did I do what God prepared for me to do? Did I fulfill the destiny that God planned for me? I never really thought about that that much. So you know why we're talking about this, don't you? Because it's so important. And this has nothing to do with your salvation. There are people who are saved, genuinely saved, genuinely born again. There's no work that they could ever do that will, will change that or undo that. Or it's, it's not up to them. It's not up to the works of, of the flesh or the works that we would do. We, we're saved by grace through faith and, and not of works. Nobody's going to be able to boast in the good work that they did. Nobody's going to be able to put any certificates up in front of the judgment seat and say, look at, you know, judge me according to this or judge me according to that. But when we talk about works, specifically the good works that God prepared, we don't want to leave undone anything that God planned for us. You know, we don't want to leave on the shelf any of the provision that was specifically set aside for the good works because God isn't obligated to prepare anything for works in a general sense, whatever you want to do, whatever you like, whatever you think, whatever you come up with in your imagination, whatever you dreamed. God's not obligated to be involved in that really at all. Not at all. Because that isn't the thing that he prepared. So how can he be consistent and prepare good works for people and then when the people show up and decide that they don't want to do those good works, he just changes his mind and says, okay, I'll, uh, I'll do the same for these works that I would have for these other ones that I planned beforehand. No, the Bible says that God's will and his word are forever settled. Amen. He is settled on this. No argument. No excuses. That's why this is so important. So what loss could we suffer? Will we lose our souls? Will we lose an opportunity to be in heaven for all of eternity? Will our salvation just go out the window if we miss this? You know, the answer to that is no. We've already, we've already answered that. But is there, a, is there something on the line here? Is this important? Is there something at stake? And the answer to that is yes, very much so. And if we miss this, we will suffer loss. And the Bible tells us that God has given each one of us an opportunity to draw close enough to him that we cannot miss and will not miss the good works that he's prepared for us. So here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, God has given me unique gifts as a skilled master builder. 
who lays a good foundation. And then he says that good foundation is only one, and that is Christ Jesus. But he's, he's given me skill as a worker to lay that foundation. That's the work that God gave for me to do, the good work. I'm a foundation builder. I know that. That's what I do. And I'm good at it. And God helps me with it and blesses it. And the foundation of faith that I lay is solid. And, and it's working. But then he says, afterward, another craftsman comes and builds on this foundation that has been laid, which is Christ. And then he gives a warning. He says, so builders, which would be us, builders, beware. Let every builder do his work carefully according to God's standards. The quality of materials used by anyone building on this foundation will soon be made apparent whether it has been built with gold, silver, and costly stones, or wood, hay, and straw. Their work will soon become evident, for the day will bring it, will make it clear, rather, because it will be revealed by blazing fire, and the fire will test and prove the workmanship of each builder. If his work stands the test of fire, he will be rewarded. If his work is consumed by the fire, he will suffer great loss. Yet he himself will barely escape destruction like one being rescued out of a burning building. So in other words, we're going to make it. But we're just going to make it with a shirt uh, uh, you know, on our back. We're going to make it like somebody who didn't have time to bring anything, not even his billfold with him, out of the house just running for your life out of the burning building and escaping destruction. So you'll make it to heaven, but the reward is not going to be there. And God delights in rewarding his children. But he cannot reward us based on something that isn't right. He can't reward wrong, but he will reward right. And he is faithful to do that. So what is right in this context? Do the good work that God prepared beforehand that you should do. Walk in the steps and the path that God designed beforehand that you should walk in them. Do that. That represents the gold, the silver, the precious stones. Build with that material. That's the material that is used for the good works. The wood, hay, and stubble is just whatever. Whatever you dreamed up whatever you came up with, whatever you decided to do. My degree, if you care to know, is in vocal performance. I was a music major. My wife was a music major. Her degree was piano performance. Did I lead singing today? Thank God I did not. <laughs> did my wife play the, the piano or the keyboard today? No, she didn't. Now, that would have been good, and, and she could do it. The good work that I had planned to do was the work of music and worship, and that's what I wanted to do. That's what I dreamed of doing, and 40 years ago, 45 years ago, I looked at all the people who were doing it, and I looked at them, and I saw myself in that same position. That was my dream. That was my desire. That's what I felt that I was equipped to do. I had the talent to do it. And next week, we'll talk about this some more because it's worth talking about a, another Sunday, don't you think? So we'll talk about it some more. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I just want to let you know that, that I thank God today for the good work that God prepared for me. It wasn't the work that I was preparing for, but God even used my preparation to lead me to the good work. So that's how good God is. God will let you think whatever silly thing you want to think about your future, and he will even all things work together for good to, to, to those who love God and are, are called according to his purpose. And so all along the way, I kept getting adjusted and getting adjusted and getting adjusted. And each time I got an adjustment, it hurt a little bit, and it hurt a little bit more, and it hurt a little bit. It kept hurting. But each adjustment brought me around to the place where I was able to finally land in a position to do the good works that God prepared beforehand that I should do them. And I want to remind you today that it's plural. So those of you that think that this is the good work 
and we're done. You know, we got the building built. We got out of 1940 and we landed at 20, 2460 and now we're done. No, this is in the past now. Amen. So we're two years plus in this building. So forgetting those things which are behind me, I press on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus to the next good work. Yes. Yes. But not just to stay busy, not to rack my brain and try to think of what to do next, but just simply to trust that God will reveal to me the next work that he planned that started with him, that will begin with him and end with him, that he provided for, that he will empower me to do, that I will do by faith. What is the next work? Because it is good works, not good work. Amen? Amen. If you're breathing today and you feel like you've missed the good works that God prepared for you because you just were unaware that he had plans for you. You never knew any of this. You never thought about any of this. And here you are now, maybe in middle age, or maybe you're retired and you're just wondering now, is there anything for me? Is there a blessing for me? Is there any destiny left for me? And I want to tell you, absolutely, there is purpose and plans still in place for you because God never quits. He never stops. He doesn't put the provision back and put it back with the rest of it, he keeps it on the shelf reserved for you. And so the moment you take that step of faith that Pastor Miriam was talking about by surrendering your will to him, from that moment, God will begin to bring you into the good works that he prepared for you to do. And I don't care if you're 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80, if you're breathing, there are good works prepared for you. God planned them for you. God provided for them. God will empower you to do them by faith in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. I, I'm believing for a, a whole army of gray-haired people rising up and doing the good works that God prepared beforehand that they should do them. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I'm praying that I'll have hair to be gray in the future too. If you're here seeking God, then you're in the right place. If, you're, if, you, if you want God to speak to you and you want to hear his voice, you're in the right place. This is the place where God will speak to you. This is the place where God will reveal himself to you. Remember that I said that working and working and working to be a good person, to do good things, will never save anybody. The Bible says that it's only by grace through faith in what Christ has done that we're saved. There's no release, there's no relief, there's no change from the sinful condition that we are born into until we come to Christ. But when we come to Jesus, he changes us. We are regenerated, a regenesis. Just like in the beginning when he created the male and female, he will recreate you in the power of God. He'll recreate you. And from that moment on, all of the revelation of why you're here and what you're to do will begin to unfold. Amen. That's the question that you've wanted answered your whole life. Why was I ever born? What am I good for? Why am I even here? Does it really even matter? Yes, because God prepared good works for you to do Amen. before you were ever born. And God knew that you would be here today, that you would hear a message that would allow you to put your faith and trust in Christ so that he could begin to unveil those good works and empower you to do them and so that his joy would be full and he would rejoice in seeing one of his sons and daughters doing what they were created to do and your joy would be full because you would be doing what you were born to do for the glory of God. So I want you to bow your heads with me and we're going to pray for God's grace to move strongly in your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray Lord, that you would reveal yourself to every person who is seeking, every person who is unsaved, every person who is tormented by their sins and convicted of the judgment that is to come. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them graciously this morning, that you would change their life, touch their heart, bring them to a place of faith in Christ. We challenge the hold that the devil has on these people we challenge the hold that the enemy has on their minds. We challenge the grip that the devil 
and all of the powers of darkness have on their life, and we break it in Jesus' name. We break it in Jesus' name. We bind those powers using the authority that's been given to us in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you that you loose captives now, and you bring about spiritual freedom, and Lord, even freedom for people to move and respond, Lord, in their soul, in Jesus' name. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, you're saying in your heart, Pastor, I want to get saved. I want to get right with God. I want to put my trust in Christ. I believe that if I do, I'll be born again. I'll be saved. My sins will be forgiven. I'll be a new creation. I'll get to do the thing that God prepared for me to do. I'll be able to do it. I'll be able to do something with my life that really matters. I'll be able to do something with my life that brings glory to God. I want to get saved. I want to trust Christ. If that's you, would you raise your hand? If you're online, you raise your hand in your living room or wherever you are. Raise your hand. Say, I want to get saved. I want to get right with God. Anywhere in the room. Pastor, I want to pray. I want you to pray for me because I want to get saved. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give my life to the Lord and put my trust in Him for salvation. In the balcony. You might be backslidden. Okay, we got some hands going up. Very good. In the, you might be backslidden. You've just wandered away from the Lord and drifted away from, from Him and your spiritual life is, is so dry. It's just, uh, it's just gone. And you know that if you come to the Lord that that will be restored and you're ready to do that. Pastor, I'm backslidden and I want to come back to the Lord. If that's you, you raise your hand. You have the freedom to do that. God is with you. God's grace is on your life that you might be able to be restored to faith and begin to walk with God and do God's purposes for your life. If you're here, then, yep, you're helping me out. Ushers are helping me out with raised hands. Anyone else? Pastor, I'm not saved, but I want to get saved. I'm backslidden, and I want to return to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Do it now. Do it this morning. Let's not put this off. Let's not, let, let's not drag it out. Let's, let's get right with God. Let's do it now. In Jesus' name, anyone else? Pastor, I want to pray. I want you to pray for me because I want to get right with God. I'm going to ask all of us to stand to our feet now, if you would, please. So I want to give you this opportunity now that we're standing. You can move freely if you're in one of these rows. You, you can get out, and I want you to come. I, I want to pray for you. You raised your hand. You wanted prayer. You come and get it now in Jesus' name. Come now in Jesus' name. I want to pray for every person. You want to come to Christ? You want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Maybe you're backslidden and you want to come back to the Lord? Yeah. You can just stand right here. Yep, you can just look at me. You're good. Yeah, you're good. We got you. You guys don't know each other, do you? You don't know each other? Yeah. Maurice, come and stand with these guys, will you? Costume. you. Costume, come and stand with these guys. Anyone else? You're coming too, aren't you? Yeah, good for you, man. Good. Anyone else? So, okay, we got three young men. Isn't that awesome? Wow. If you're a young person and you're not saved, I'm just telling you, you're going to just spin your wheels until you come to Christ. I'm just telling you, you're going to do stuff, but it's not going to be this, it's not going to be the right stuff. The quicker you get on this and get on track with God, you watch and see what's going to happen with your life. You don't want to, you don't want to wind up being a burned out old guy, bitter, filled with regrets, leaving a trail of wreckage, you know, in your wake of wounded, broken people because you were messed up and didn't know, didn't, didn't know the Lord and didn't want to do God's will, wanted to do your own thing. You know, this is the time to humble yourself and come to the Lord. Guys, let's pray because you're here. You're in the right place. Amen. Good for you. I want you to pray this with me. I want you to really just speak up now and just speak strongly back to me what, what I'm going to help you with. So, but you're talking to God, but I want you to, I want you to let him hear your voice. 
Okay? So just speak it out. All right? I want you to say this with me. Lord Jesus, I am here to surrender to you. I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you everything. Take me. Possess me. Own me. Lord, I thank you for dying on the cross, for bleeding and suffering to wash me from my sins. And I declare that in the name of Jesus, I'm saved. Saved from judgment. Saved from condemnation. Saved from destruction. I'm saved for the Lord. To serve the Lord. To do the good works that he prepared beforehand that I should do them. And Lord, I thank you for by grace, through faith, I am saved. Amen. 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 Praise God.